Hello and welcome back to the Encherati studio. I'm now joined by Jeff, who's the CEO of uh, ABB Ventex. Uh, Jeff, welcome to the studio, first of all. Th thanks for making the time out of your schedule to be, uh, be with us today. And uh, just uh, very quickly, I, I know you guys have done the Global Smart Grid Impact Report. What, what were some of the sort of highlights uh, of that? Because I know we were talking off air and th there's another topic we want to talk about, but uh, just, uh, just to pull some of that out uh, and, and give our viewers a, a little bit about what the findings actually brought yeah, to the yeah. front. Yeah, we had a lot of fun with this. Uh, if, if you ask 100 people in this industry the definition and their definition of a smart grid, you're going to get a hundred different answers and that was also evidenced in the in the results of the survey is that there's no such thing as one perfect pure smart grid there's no absolute clear definition everyone is doing different things and having different levels of success and it's really dri driven by what's important in the community in which they they provide energy and uh, it can be uh, frustrating for people who would like to have clarity around the definition. I think it's actually liberating because it means you've got enough latitude and freedom to innovate. And for us, the, the key word here is innovate. Is this a space that's open to new ideas and new ways of thinking and new ways of execution? So I, I see it as good news. And on that topic, there's been a lot of talk about OT-IT convergence. Uh, what that can bring for a utility and I've had a, many an interview where people have talked about that from a holistic standpoint and say oh and it can bring this, it can bring that, and it can yeah. bring that and, and whenever I, I, I say well that sounds great but do you have any real world proof points yep. along that and uh, what's interesting is when we were talking off air that uh, you know you've actually rolled this out. Yes. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit more about what the real world experiences when you have that sure. at your disposal. Yeah. Well, the, the promise of IT and OT convergence, IT being business software and OT being the operational technology, the machine level code that operates the, the machinery, there's always been this chasm and it's been a dream in this industry for the last 15 years to somehow get these to merge and it's an industry that's been very frustrated by a lack of progress. It's also something that we take for granted in our everyday life. I mean, let's face it, when you buy a motor vehicle today, it's a convergence of IT and OT. There's a massive amount of software written in the vehicle that allows it to personalize its performance based on what's important to you. But we don't see it evidenced in industrial strength software. Uh, for us, we were able to do it because we are part of ABB, and so we have complete access to the people, the domain experts for transformers, batteries, circuit breakers, and we have access also to all the algorithms and the performance history of those devices, the, the OT. Mm -hmm. And so for us, taking our IT experience with the ABB OT experience, we teamed with a customer in North America called AEP, American Electric Power. The dream at AEP, which is the largest distribution and transmission network in North America with over 250,000 miles of, of connectivity was to have deep insight into how all of that infrastructure is really running. Today, how do you do it? You send a crew out, they, they, they take some readings, they fill out some forms, it may sit on a shelf somewhere, no one sees it. If data is being extracted, it's really at, at, a, at an operator level and it's meaningless to a business decision maker. So we're sucking all of that information and it doesn't matter if it's coming live from sensors or if it's data that's been captured in a spreadsheet or a Word document and, and using a, a, a massive analytics engine that we have, we're analyzing and interpreting that and then we're presenting it to the business decision makers at AEP so that they can do a better job of operating the network. So what does this mean to them? It means that they can sweat the assets. That's their phrase. They can get more life out of assets because they're seeing the actual condition of the device as it's being used. And, and that must give you a whole huge amount of operational efficiency as well because if you can uh, look at a device profile and you say well when the profile suddenly starts moving into this shape it's gonna fail yes and it's gonna fail and, it, and then 
you can look around and say, well, what else is going to fail in this mm -hmm. area? Yeah. And send the right crew to the yeah. right place so that they can do the whole job all at yeah. once. Yeah. That, absolutely. And, and the real brilliance is AEP is taking it even further than that. They're looking at if this fails, they're doing the what if analysis, the business case analysis. If this fails, what, what's the economic impact, the impact on our consumers? Uh, quite frankly, if it's a, if it's a device that is, is at the end of a country road and impacts a farm, that requires a different level of attention than if it's going to take out a five block uh, city area in Columbus, Ohio. Or so a they, hospital or something exactly, like that. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it really is revealing all that operational information, but it's presenting it in the language of a business leader so they can make the right business decisions. As a result, they get more life out of the existing assets. They're not replacing assets that are performing well. It may be at end of life. And they're also delivering higher availability to their customers. Because that's half the trick, isn't it? Because if you get this wash of data, and it's probably more than a wash of data, yeah. it probably does it an injustice. But the, the trick is, and what I've always found, is about displaying that in a meaningful way to the, to the right person. So when you said that, I, I started getting visions of Minority Report and things like that. So, so what does that sort of display look like? I mean, how have you cracked that challenge to, to make it like useful? Well, the display is dictated by what the business decision maker needs. And one of the things we obsess on in Ventex is an extraordinary user experience. Not user interface, but user experience. We believe that technology should bend itself to serve the will of the people not the other way around. So we've, we've engaged with the customer's decision makers and said, how do you need to see this so that it is meaningful? Well, the first thing that jumps out is they don't want to see spreadsheets, they don't want to see data. At the opposite end, they just don't want to see red, yellow, and green lights. There's something in between that they need to see. Help me understand what is at risk of failure and help me understand in an intuitive way the impact on the grid. And that's the power of, of working with our, our UX team, our user experience team, and the customer. And, and uh, you know, in that s scenario with the, with the particular customer that we're talking about is, have they turned around to you guys, and I'm giving you a free plug here, have they turned around to you guys and said, well, because of this, we have made an operational efficiency of X, whatever the dollar yeah. amount is, and, and other things. Can you bring some of that to life? Because I think it be this industry has heard a lot about the theoretical, what theoretically could manifest itself when yes. you get that convergence. It'd be nice to hear some real hard numbers yeah. behind that. Yep, they've shared some with us. A lot of it is is so amazing that they're not comfortable sharing it. The numbers are bigger than they expected. Uh, but they've given us an understanding of the rationale and how that was calculated. And so we've taken that and we've built a model that helps other customers understand precisely where the ROI is in this. It's all about ROI. I mean, it, it is not about the cost of the software or the savings. It's really the return on the overall investment. And so we're now prepared to, to discuss with customers potential ROI scenarios in their business based on their own numbers. And what sort of ROI time frame are we looking at? Is, is this like a five-year ROI or, 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 or just to, to give, get an idea of you know, how quickly can you, I'm, first of all, I'm not belittling how the complexity of yeah. what it takes to put yeah. this in. I would imagine that take, that takes some time, yeah. but how quickly can you get that investment back? Yeah, part of it is, is based on just empirical data. And part of it also is in intuition that says, wow, if, if, I, if a transformer costs a million dollars, the cost of replacing a failed transformer, if it explodes, is 8x, eight times that. All you have to do is have one or two of those events happen in, in your grid, and you've more than justified it. So part of it is, is the empirical analysis, which says it's less than a few years. It's a very, very quick payback. Part of it also is what is our risk if we don't do this? And my guess is over the next several years as more people adopt the, the Ventix Asset Health portfolio, they will stop justifying it just on our ROI. I think it will be table stakes. I think it's just going to be the way you do business. It'll be one of those tipping points as well, why wouldn't you do it this way? Indeed. You know, 
you know, why do you want to have a business that even carries the risk of something blowing up? You exactly. Know, however small that may exactly. be. Exactly. Uh, uh, things like that. And so mm. when you when you're working in this space and uh, you you you're an IT company, you know, you're part of Vent, uh, ABB is an IT company. Where next? Where, where do you where do you guys see that? Okay, we uh, we think we could push this a little bit further. This is where we we would like to go if we had a willing partner. Well, for Asset Health, basically any transmission and distribution company in the world should be looking at it, and we're very very busy right now responding to that demand. But it also has a great opportunity in generation. Uh, and we're doing a variation of that with EDF, Electricity de France. For them, the challenge is how do we get more out of our existing nuclear infrastructure? It's very tough to get approval to, to build another nuclear plant yeah. outside of China. And right it takes now. a long time. And it takes a long time. Yeah. And what we've done with EDF is through using technology and working with them, we're implementing a new level of clearance and lockout management for their existing nuclear infrastructure, which should, be, which should give them an opportunity to run the existing infrastructure at a higher capacity and at the same time actually improve worker safety in this post-Fukushima time. And you can't do it without great software technology and deep domain expertise. So we're thrilled with the partnership with EDF on that project. And, and, uh with with EDF and one of the other conversations that uh, I hear uh, a lot is, uh, you know, building the smart grid because we need to integrate renewable energy sources, yes. which just makes sense, yes. you know, yeah. uh, uh, in order to do that. Uh, where I, where are you seeing the complexities around that in terms yeah. of the IT over because that really does need an IT overlay in order to get yeah. maximum efficiency out yeah. of that. We, we have another great example of that that's gone into production and that's with Vattenfall here in Europe where all of a sudden there's been an insertion of a, of a significant amount of, of, of energy being generated from offshore wind but as you know it's unpredictable and how do you how do you model for that and predict that in an existing smart grid and we're helping them deploy a next generation smart grid that that understands and recognizes the the, the variable impact in a significant am, uh, amount on the on the grid through offshore wind so we're already doing that because the, the, uh, those offshore farms aren't exactly small and when all, everything starts to spin. and then you've got the other thing mm -hmm. which i never knew until about uh, sort of three months ago is that if the wind is too strong you got to shut the turbines down yes. so suddenly you go from way well, hey, we're making lots of free energy exactly to none yeah absolutely absolutely and and that's where we're working with uh, eon where eon is doing some very clever things to try to figure out how to gently decrease the the uh, an influx of, of energy from an, uh, a wind farm or from other some other what renewable the, What they need source. is some Formula One brakes at the back of it, you Indeed. know, the, the carbon discs or yeah. something like that. But all connected with yeah. technology. Yeah. All connected with technology. We're, we're at a point where we can't throw people at these problems anymore. We've got to use brilliant technology. Oh, no, you have to. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, especially if you've got an offshore wind farm, you can't have speedboats zipping around, you yeah. know, putting the brakes on. That would yeah. just be, uh, uh, be insane. So we're, we're kind of coming to the end of our time in the, in the studio, and it's been great to hear those sort of real-world uh, examples. I, I've got a, I'm going to throw a slight curveball at you. Uh, I didn't know you were into American baseball. I'm not into American baseball. You've thrown that right back at me, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, I'm going to give you my job for a second. Uh, okay. Turn you into a reporter, Great. and uh, you've been watching uh, the uh, presentations and the conference. Yeah, it's and, uh, very exciting like that. here. Yeah. And uh, what uh, what's what's what would you say has been the thing that uh, you've seen or heard, and you're within your rights to say nothing's moved on. Yeah. That uh, that really gets you excited. That especially in the field that you're in. That okay, right? We're go we're going to go now. Yeah. I, I have to give you a parable that, that a customer told me recently. He, he's an executive with, with a, a very, very large energy company. And he said, Jeff, if Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, walked into a phone company today and they handed him 
an iPhone, he would not know what to do with it. He wouldn't recognize the infrastructure and he would be lost. But if Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb, walked into our building tomorrow, we could give him a job immediately. At the same time, he said, that's now in the past. So many factors are impacting the energy industry in ways that we never imagined. That it's a, there, there's a high level of disruption, and I think you're seeing that here just in the intensity of, of discussions that we're having with customers. Disruption gives us all an opportunity to innovate. It gives us kind of a free pass to say there's a better way to do things. I can't think of a better time to be in this industry than right now where the disruption, the, you know, the, the market factors of, of sources of energy and prices, uh, natural disasters and the impact on people's lives, and the intimate relationship that energy providers need to have with their consumers all make it a really exciting time to be in this space. And, uh, I, uh, and, and that's a great analogy, and we, we're going to uh, uh, end it there, because Good. if I carry on, we'll be here for another half hour, and uh, I'd love to have the opportunity to do, uh, talk with you again, um, you know, hopefully not in 12 months' time, but hopefully no, we can engineer, keep it going. Keep Adam, it going. Thank you. So uh, I'd love to do that. Uh, thank you as well for watching. Uh, it's been another Gerati interview. Uh, we're shooting for some kind of record. We're going to do 43 of these while we're at European Utility Week. But remember, all 300-odd presentations from the conference are also available on the, the Angerati network. So we hope you enjoy that as well. And uh, thanks once again to Jeff. Thank thanks, you. Adam.